back, and our panelists are our keynote people, uh, Mark Buchanan, Caroline Lewis, Steve Bell, Sister Sue Mosteller, Marvin McMichael, and uh, wonderful people. And, and tonight is really about just getting to know them a little bit because they are our key leaders in the next few days. And um, so Will Ingram is, is co-hosting this with me, and Will is the minister of St. Andrew's Presbyterian, one of our partner churches. And we just want you to start by um, telling us a bit about your story, your call, where you've come from, a bit about who you are. So the mic's there, and you can pass it around. I came to faith in Christ when I was 21 years old, and that's too long a story to get into, but it was a, it was a very radical encounter with Jesus that uh, immediately, you know, when Peter talks about going from darkness to light, that's what it felt like for me. But no notion at all of going into of some vocational pastoral work. And about eight years later, a church called me and asked if I'd like to be their pastor. It was that abrupt, that strange, that out of the blue. And it had not entered my head up until that moment that that might be a possible vocation for me. And quite honestly, I said yes to that out of, I just needed a job. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and God honored that. And so I, my intention was I'd do this for two or three years, bumble around, and, and then find a real job. And I was in pastoral ministry for 24 years. And it was actually through that experience of simply serving a church, learning how to preach by preaching, learning how to counsel by counseling, learning how to lead by leading, that I, I really sensed the call of God emerged out of the, it was almost like Lord of the Rings, you know, the, 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 sorry if, if that's kind of um, not part of your world of reference, but virtually everybody emerges as a leader by leading in that story. Uh, they have to go on the journey, and they have to discover capacity and camaraderie, et cetera, et cetera. And that was really the story for me. And so um, I, my first sermon was simply being thrown into a pulpit about a month after I started in a pastoral role and trying to figure my way out of that. So um, that's, that's my story of calling. I grew up the daughter of a Lutheran pastor. So as a preacher's kid, you know how that goes. You swear you'll never be a pastor, <laughs> nor will you marry one. And of course, both of those happened to me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I grew up as a preacher's kid and my first call, my first calling was to, mu to music. Uh, it was violin performance and then decided that, uh, or just felt that uh, 10 hours in a practice room by myself was a rather lonely way to spend my life. And uh, so I had a, a sort of an epiphany at that point of wondering, uh, this may not be the thing for me. And, uh, but it really, I got to seminary by way of having an idea that I want to do something in the church. That's all I had going for me, something in the church. That was it. Went to seminary and uh, didn't know if I was going to do an MA or a Master's of Divinity. And the registrar at the time said, well, why don't you take Greek? Because you need Greek for being a Master's of Divinity student. If you're not sure, you should probably just take Greek. So I took Greek. And, and this is, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to admit this, but uh, the very first day, in love, loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. And so then went through and, uh, and a couple people said, you might want to think about graduate school. And so, uh, yeah, it was sort of a, um, a gradual <laughs> nudging along. Uh, and as it turned out, eight of my family members, including I, have graduated from the institution where I work. So Luther Seminary. So. It's, I also think it's, that's a nice little call story, but I think it's probably genetic. <laughs> um, I come from a family of uh, preachers. My, my, my grandfather's a uh, brilliant preacher. My father's a brilliant preacher. 
Um, he, uh, he became a, a ch prison chaplain when I was a little boy, and so from eight years old on, that's where I went to churches and prisons in Canada, federal prisons. And it was inmates that taught me to play guitar. They used to have jam sessions on Saturday afternoons in the chapel. And uh, when they heard that I wanted to learn how to play, they actually invited me in. And so that's where you'd find me every Saturday afternoon um, uh, growing up. Um, and I love to say it, that I, that I, and I always say this, that I, I do what I do now largely because Canada's most unwanted men invested in me when I was a little boy. And that's just actually true. Um, I came out of high school, didn't really fit in churches because I grew up in sort of prison church where things were not so neat and tidy, and so I just found myself alien. Um, started playing in the bar scene. I played for about a decade in nightclubs across the country. All kinds of bands, jazz bands and rock bands and dance bands and cover bands and folk groups and, and really not really knowing what to do with my life. And after about 10 years, I had an experience one night in my room where I felt God saying to me, this time of your life is over. I have something else for you to do. And that was the entire message. I, um, I quit playing. I thought I was hanging up my guitars. Um, and um, all of a sudden, the music that I now do just started falling out of the sky. I, I don't know how else to say it. Um, an old family friend showed up one day and, and wrote a check and said, you need to record an album. And he paid for it. And um, I made, I think, 100 copies, and, which I hope to give away to mostly relatives at Christmas time. And, um, and from those, people started calling and saying, I heard your music at your uncle's place, could I get a copy, or you know, that kind of thing. And then over the years, more and more people started phoning me, asking me to sing, and this has just sort of come about that quite naturally. So I, I do this because everything else kind of didn't work. <laughs> 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 I'm coming from the uh, Catholic background, and it's not a church that encourages women to preach. So uh, I was never expecting to have any experience in preaching, but um, in, 1970, in 1967, I met John Vanier, and uh, he was giving a lecture at uh, the university, and uh, at that time, the sisters had to go out in pairs. So uh, I was studying, and. I had said, I don't like studying, so if anybody wants a partner, I'll just ask me and I'll go with you. And so this sister came and she said, I want to hear this man, he's coming to speak, and would you come with me? And I said, what's he talking about? And she said, well, he works with people with disabilities in France. And I said, well, you know, I'm really not very interested, so if you can find anybody else, I said, I'd be glad. But uh, she came at supper and said, I didn't find anybody, so will you come? So I, so I said, okay. So. I sat down and uh, John began to talk about Jesus. And by that time, I had been a sister for 15 years, but I had never heard anybody speak about Jesus like that. Honestly, I, I felt as though he was somebody who had had breakfast with Jesus that morning, <laughs> that he, he, he was that intimate uh, with, with, with Jesus and the life of Jesus. And I, uh, he was giving seven lectures, and I want to tell you, I was at every one of them. <laughs> and uh, I can still remember all those years back uh, how he talked that night and what he said and how my heart just expanded. So he, uh, we invited him to come from France and to uh, give some retreats. And so he said he would come if we gathered not just religious, not just the sort of all the people who all go to church. He said, why don't you invite people who are a little bit on the margins? Why don't you look for uh, university students who might not ever go to church? And why don't you look for people who might be in institutions and hospitals? And, and why don't you bring elderly people to the retreats? And uh, so we had this, what we called a faith and a sharing retreat. <laughs> And again, I was there for seven days, and uh, I, my heart just all the time opening, opening to say, I want to know Jesus. I really want to know Jesus. So uh, John came back, and then we had scheduled him for a retreat, and then he got sick, so he called and said, you do the retreat. And I was just, pardon? And he said, you do the retreat. He said, and I said, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know how to begin. 
And he said, talk about Jesus. Just read the gospel and let Jesus tell you what you need to say. And uh, I prayed a lot and I went to the retreat. It was very, very simple. I told a lot of stories. But then I was asked to give other retreats and so I started to preach. And uh, that's how my <laughs> preaching began. I was uh, 16 in my hometown of Chicago. And I went to a summer camp just on the outside of the city. I didn't go to camp because I was particularly religious. I went to camp because all the prettiest girls I knew were going to summer camp. And so I was, I was going because they were going to be there and it was going to be six days of, uh, you know, baseball and recreation and fellowship and fun. It was a Sunday afternoon through a Saturday morning. I really can't remember any of the campfires Sunday night through Thursday. I just, they were just a blur. But on the Friday night, the last night of the camp, uh, the camp pastor, after he preached on something, I don't know what it was, but he gave this invitation. He said, anybody who would like to just commit their lives to Christ, just promise to be a good Christian. And he pointed to the left of the campfire and he said, go take a white candle, put it under your pillow tonight, pray about it, and remember in the morning that you promised God that you were going to make this decision just to be a good Christian. But he said, if you would like to devote your life to full-time Christian service as a pastor, as a missionary, as a Christian educator, as a Whatever, whatever your gifts might be. And he pointed to the right side of the campfire and said, you go take a pink candle, put it under your pillow, pray about it, but if you take a pink candle, when you get back to your home church, tell your pastor that you've got this thing about ministry on your mind so that he can uh, begin to direct you. So I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that I went to the left and got a white candle. I didn't really want that, but you know, you had to pick one or the other, so uh, I went and I got a white candle, put it under my pillow, gave it no thought, no prayer, nothing. Put it there, went to sleep, woke up the next morning, and here's a pink candle <laughs> under my pillow. So I'm looking around the camp, you know, looking around the, uh, the tent we had uh, to see who was looking at me, to see, you know, who was, whose smile was going to give them away. Nobody was paying any attention to me. I didn't say anything. Got on the bus heading back, about an hour's drive back to Chicago. I was looking around to see, you know, somebody's going to give this away. Nothing. I didn't tell the pastor because I didn't pick this pink candle. But the next Sunday, the pastor says he had just been told by somebody else in our group that Marvin has been called to the ministry. <laughs> and uh, he set a date for my trial sermon. I, I, you know, wait a minute. This is, this is not what I had in mind. Nobody ever came to me to say that they were the one that did this. When I preached the trial sermon, nobody said, you're taking this too far now. This is just out of hand. To this date, nobody has said, I was the one that changed your candle. So, since 1964, when this happened, I've kept a pink candle on my desk every day. I look at that pink candle every day to remind myself of the mystery of God. I don't know what happened. I don't know how it happened. I don't think I ever said yes at the moment that it happened. But uh, God leads his dear children along. Now, the three major mentors of my life were Samuel Proctor, 
William Augustus Jones and Martin Luther King Jr. I am now the president of the school where all three of them were students. So they're in heaven wondering how in the world this happened. <laughs> and God is still amazing me. Where's, uh, where's Malcolm Sinclair? Okay, because he was telling me this story about changing a white and pink candle at summer camp way a long time ago, <laughs> actually. Was just, a... Um, just a question. Uh, how many people have been to the preaching festival in previous years? Okay. How many people for whom this is the first time? Okay, well, welcome. It's good to have you here. One of the real blessings and benefits of this gathering is that it's small enough and a human enough scale that you get a chance to meet with and interact with uh, the speakers that come each year. Many of us who've been part of previous ones have had a chance to sit at table with the Walter Brueggemanns and the Fleming Rutledges and the Cardinal Tom Connors, uh, Collins of the world. And it's, it's wonderful to have the chance to do that. And we're looking forward to that in the next couple of days. So you are inspirations to many of us already, and it's a blessing to have you among us. Um, I'm interested in knowing who right now in your life, you, you've mentioned some people who have been mentors in the past, who right now in your life is inspiring you? It might be a preacher, it might be a writer, it might be an artist, it might be somebody in your church, the Lester Randalls of, of your church, but who comes to mind in that communion of saints that is inspiring you right now and pushing you and challenging you and provoking you to go further in your faith and in your, in your vocation. Um, I, I know right away. It's, um, I, I, have, I, have, I have been so inspired since I was a little boy by Francis of Assisi um, so powerfully, but as of late, it's clear that I cannot stop reading, and she hasn't written very much. She hasn't said very much. Um, what she left behind is very, very humble and small, but the words are staggering, and her ministry was so quiet and so humble um, and so long and so freighted with battles um, with the powers that be, and yet she just had this humble, quiet persistence to do what God had called her to do. Um, the strength and the power of that woman while remaining very small all the way along, just I find staggering. So uh, that is that is someone who right now I just, I'm reading and rereading and rereading and rereading. You look at your pink candle every day. I have a picture on my desk of a woman called Rita and uh, she lives in Montreal, and she lives in a nursing home. Uh, she's been in bed on her back without ever being in a wheelchair or ever turning over since 1962. And she's paralyzed. She's now 91 years old. And uh, she is a woman who radiates love and kindness and goodness and the beauty of who Jesus is. I go to see her once a year, and then we don't communicate very much, but I've asked her a lot of questions about her illness and so on. She, she was, uh, when she was 19, she had uh, her appendix out, and the nurse gave her uh, the wrong injection. It was spinal. <coughs> and uh, she started to yell when the nurse gave her the needle and, the, and, and saying, stop, stop. And the nurse just kept giving it to her and gave her the whole dose and then went into the next room and said to the doctor, I, I don't know why she's screaming so much. And the doctor said, what did you give her? And apparently they looked at the bottle and Rita said, I heard the doctor say she should be dead. So she was 19 and then she just started to get more, more and more paralyzed. So she's paralyzed from here down. But uh, she's a woman of God, and uh, she's living in this nursing home lots and lots of time. 
She doesn't watch a lot of television. And uh, so when you talk to her, I said to her one time, what do you think of that nurse who gave you the wrong injection? She just, this huge smile, and she said, oh, I pray for her every day that she'll forget what she did. And uh, she has a, a, a wonderful way of welcoming and of listening, but also of conforming her whole life to whatever it is that God wants. And uh, she had a bad stroke of several years ago, and she went blind and deaf. She said that was the worst time because she didn't know who was in her room. <laughs> And uh, she said, I couldn't tell anything until somebody touched me, and then it always scared me because she couldn't see and she couldn't hear. And she told Jesus, she said, I told him, I, I can't do this. I can't do it. And she said, somewhere the words came to me, my grace is enough. And she said, right away, I said, okay, I'll do it, but you have to help me. <laughs> and then she gradually emerged from after, like we went to see her every year and she was blind, she got her hearing back and then we got the call that she could see again. So she, Jesus has worked things in her life that have been very difficult to understand, but she's the person that I think about who is there hour after hour, day after day alone praying for the world, praying for us, and I think doing a lot of good. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no, thank you. So the pink candle was 1964. Two years later, again, my hometown in Chicago, Martin Luther King Jr. came to Chicago for what was supposed to be an open housing campaign uh, because in 1966, Chicago was the most racially segregated city in the United States. You would have thought that it would have been a city in the Deep South or someplace along the Mississippi River, maybe St. Louis or something, but Chicago, Detroit, Gary, Indiana, and Cleveland, Ohio were the four most residentially segregated cities in the country. <clears throat> and so that summer, he came to lead a summer-long demonstration. And I was working in Poole Brothers Print Shop as a graphic artist running a line type machine. That was, see the pink candle had not taken effect yet, so I was, I was just printing. I went to the break room for lunch. I read in the newspaper that Dr. King was coming to Chicago. I should tell you that the only product that Poor Brothers print shop produced was Playboy magazine. So here I was, 18 years old, with the job of my dreams, you know, just, uh, <laughs> what can I tell you? The pink candle had taken no effect. <laughs> but I went that night to hear Dr. King, went on a few marches with him into some very, very hostile territory discovered that that's where the pink candle was leading all along, to a, to a ministry that was informed and shaped by a kind of social activism, as I was saying to you last night, a kind of uh, the edge of the gospel that leans toward justice. So now, uh, Dr. King is a graduate of Crozer Seminary. Crozer is merged in with Colgate Rochester. So just outside my office door, as I go to work every day, there is a photograph of Martin King at the age of 19 when he entered Crozer. 
he was uh, two years ahead of his class. And um, so I passed by him every day. And I can almost hear him urging me to keep the faith. So there's no doubt that that's the person. Was it supposed to be a live person? Or a dead <laughs> it could be a dead person? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, okay. She's really dead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is going to... Um, I'm, wow, I, I can't believe I'm saying this. Uh, <laughs> the um, person who inspires me the most um, when it comes to who Jesus is, doing theology, and what preaching is all about is the Gospel of John. I just... I can read it over and over again, and every single time, I mean, a lot of you know that that's my guy, you know, I mean, he's like the second love of my life, or well, sometimes the first, depending on the day, but um, I mean, I just, you know, I love John, but that's the first thing that came to my mind, was just, I, uh, it, it inspire, he inspires me to... I'm assuming it's a he, it could be a she, but he inspires me to be creative um, when thinking about God. Um, he inspires me to be a better preacher. Um, he inspires me to remember all the time uh, the Greeks' request, sir, we wish to see Jesus. So it just... Uh, that's, that's, that's who it is. Yeah. Oh, that's kind of... <laughs> God inspires me. I actually, over the last year, have been memorizing large chunks of uh, Joannine literature, so the Upper Room Discourse and uh, currently First John. And uh, I, I have to say that the deeper I go into John, the less I know. I mean, it's, it's just this world that opens and opens and opens, but I uh, probably could have been a really bad um, impersonator through my life, uh, kind of a poor man's rich little, because I'm so impressionable when I read a really great writer or hear a really great preacher that if I read them too much or listen to them too much, I start to parody them, not intentionally. It's a mimicry that just comes out uh, as a parody. So I've learned to limit when I, currently I'm, I'm in love with Belden Lane, for instance, but I, I really do need to kind of limit how much I read because I'll start to think like him and write like him, and I'll do a really bad job of that. But I would have to say the person who inspires me the most is my wife, Cheryl. Um, she is the most authentic Christian that I know. Uh, a number of years ago when I was living in Vancouver Island, I felt very led of God to begin a work among our first peoples, uh, the Cowichan peoples. And, uh, and, it, and it had a dramatic effect on me, and to some extent we, we actually saw some, some significant things happen within the community. But what happened to my wife was uh, astonishing. And when we moved to Calgary three years ago, she was so out of sorts until she got established on the native community, native community Morley, just 20 minutes west of us. And uh, all her best friends are, are First Nations. And it, it's just a remarkable thing to, it's incarnational with her. Uh, this is a genuine, deep, rich friendship that's mutually transforming uh, with her and, and her, first, uh, many, her friends. And, and uh, she, she, when she spends, she's usually two or three days out on Morley. Um, and, and by the way, this is not any kind of uh, lucky you, you know, we, we've come. Um, it's very much a, a, a walking together and a, and a relationship of mutual honor. And she'll just come home from her days out on, on the, uh, in the First Nations community, utterly radiant and wanting to talk about just what's happening and what's happening in her. And I, I look on in awe because for me, um, 
I can intellectualize things so quickly, and it can be about, you know, persuading people and calling people to some life that I may not be living out in an incarnational way, but then every week, there's my beautiful wife um, being the person I want to be, so. One more question. Um, theme over the next couple of days has to do with preparations for Advent and Christmas, and I'm sure that uh, I don't want you to give away too much of what you've been preparing to say in the next couple of days, but for you at this stage in your journey, what's the, what's the moment that makes Advent and Christmas real? What's the gem moment? What's the story that really uh, speaks to you and transforms that whole season for you? I keep coming back in utter wonder to those, especially the Lucan stories and the songs around Luke. We sang one at the close, the Nunc Dimittis, or is that how you say it anyhow? The, you know, uh, now I can die, basically. <laughs> and I just, um, the, those stories, I think partly, and I'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow, I spent last Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in Bethlehem with my son. And it was subversive in ways I'll, I'll get into tomorrow. But when I, it, it brought to life, not only in terms of, you know, looking at the landscape where Probably those shepherds, for instance, were sitting out when this angel choir appeared and announced good news. So it gave that kind of, it earthed it for me. But as I'll talk about tomorrow, I, I realized that I had such sentimentalized versions of the Advent story that it brought me up short being in, in that city uh, on those, those holy nights and realizing this is the world that continually needs that declaration, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Uh, mine is John 1.14, definitely. Um, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And uh, my uh, birthday is December 24. Really? We should get together. <laughs> But I'm embarrassed to say that uh, I, for a very, very, very long time, I did not know that my birthday was not on Christmas Day uh, because we always celebrated Christmas on Christmas Eve. And, uh, and I'll never forget when somebody said to me, I was, I was embarrassingly old, I'm not even going to tell you how old I was, and somebody said to me, wow, your, your, you know, your birthday's the, the day after Christmas, and I said, no, it isn't. No, no, no. It's Christmas. That's, you know, and, and there's something about, for me, um, holding together John 1, 14 and my own birth that's really powerful for me and that's, that reminds me in such a um, profound way uh, that God committed God's self to be fully human and uh, that that gift of being a human being and being alive and um, moving, dwelling among this world with all of these people and, and all of its challenges and all of its joys is, um, is, an, is an extraordinary gift <laughs> and extraordinary, we have extraordinary lives and so yeah that's that's it for me John 1 14 and um, and being so grateful that I'm alive <laughs> that I was born <laughs> um, I think for me it's, it's 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 a little weird I think but um, pondering uh, deeply over the years what uh, barrenness would mean um, for for a woman and um, especially in that culture at that time, but I did grow up in a family of saints, like my grandparents and my parents and my sisters and, and my uncles and my aunts are all just really wonderfully profound Christians. And growing up, I didn't feel that. I, I just felt always a vacancy. I had made my formal commitment to Christ, so I kind of knew I'd signed 
the right piece of the document. I was going to get into heaven, but there was a vacancy there. There was a bareness there. <laughs> yeah, I took the white candle. <laughs> yeah, and and I remember when what it was, a, it was. It actually wasn't all that long ago, really, when I started to actually mourn this barrenness that I would never be with child, so to speak, and um, start to really enter into that a little bit. And it was when I started doing, allowing myself to feel that pain, uh, that that this may never come for me, right. Um, what I see in others, um, that transformed Christmas for me, and it certainly transformed Advent for me. You know, when I started to, to realize that there was something deeply, in a sense, that this is a season that we come to understand most profoundly that we relate to God in this particular metaphor as maternal spouse, and that's a very different thing. Um, and there is a sense in me of having come to receive the seed of God that I bear and carry and deliver as gift for the life of the world now. And I find crazy joy in that. For me, there's a, <clears throat> the sense of how little it is and how quiet it happened. And it's been a very hard for me to get there because there's so much noise about Christmas and we're already starting to put up the decorations so our eyes and our ears and the Christmas carols are all coming and, and so on. But when you think of the event itself was so quiet and God is just slipping into the world quietly to pitch his tent among us, to be one with us and with no show of godhood, no lording it over us. In fact, so quiet that we don't even recognize him. And I think that many of the spiritual events in my life have happened in that way where it's just so small and quiet, but it's so significant. And uh, so it's hard to come to quietness on Christmas Day, and it's hard. But I think during the preparation more and more, I, I just long to rest kind of with the God who dwells in me, to rest there and to try to comprehend what an act this was, that God came so quietly and then he doesn't say anything for 30 years, which I think is so extraordinary. I mean, he has to save the world, and he has a very, very important mission, and he should get out there and get started. <laughs> but he doesn't say anything for 30 years. He's just living among us, unrecognized. And I guess that helps me then to say he's here among us, and. Do we recognize him in each other, and do we recognize him in, in the people that we're meeting? Uh, I have recently been brooding over the end of one of the verses of the hymn, Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart. That verse ending that says, teach me the patience of unanswered prayer. So when I come to Advent, I think about the 700 years that Israel had been waiting for the Messiah to come. And the deep belief in the disciples that he had come. And then he died. And then he was raised, and so my text tomorrow is in Acts 1, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Because time is up. And if you're going to do what we thought you were going to do and you're getting ready to leave, you've got to do it now. So the question is the difference between what they thought the Messiah would do 
and what the Messiah actually came to do and how does he get them onto his program. But as an oppressed person, as a person whose whole life has been lived under the umbrella, the inescapable umbrella of racism in my own country, and the years and years and years during which my people have labored to break free from it. I take great comfort in that verse. Teach me the patience of unanswered prayer. Thank you to each one of you. Thanks, Will. We're in for a couple of wonderful days. And um, we start again tomorrow morning at promptly at 9. Um, there'll be refreshments and registration before that. Um, if you haven't registered, we'd love to have you join us. And um, if you're not able to be here tomorrow on Tuesday, we'd love to have you come back tomorrow night. And uh, Dr. McNicholas, whet our appetite a little bit for what we're in for tomorrow night. We are, we are, Will just said to me, uh, what a wonderful group of people. And um, I think by the end of all this, we're going to say the same thing about all of you. So thank you for being with us. And uh, God bless you. We'll see you in the morning. <laughs>